So we're going to go ahead and uh, shift gears a little bit. Uh, Dr. Piroth, who works at Rush University in Chicago, uh, her bio I shared earlier with everyone is on the NFL's uh, Head and Spine Committee, is uh, our consultant with United States Soccer and NWSL. Uh, Dr. Beth Piroth, thanks for being here. George, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be with you all. So like the other presenters, I have a great time, so we're going to go through a number of things. But I thought it would be really helpful. Come next slide, please. I thought it'd be really helpful to talk about what are the key elements? If you are a coach or an administrator or a parent, what are the key elements that you should be looking at to have a concussion program? And there's sort of six main things we're going to talk about that I really want you to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So the first really is about education. And I can't say this enough. We really need everyone to be in, in educated on concussions. This means players, coaches, parents, administrators, and officials. And I always talk about we need as many eyes on these players as possible to know when somebody has suffered a concussion or a possible concussion. Next slide, please. And the reason for this is that when we talk about concussions, we break it down into two um, main issues. There's the signs and the symptoms. And the signs are those things that are observable by others. So this is why we want teammates to be able to, to know what a concussion looks like so they can say to their coach, you know, my teammate over here looks confused. She's acting oddly. We want coaches to understand that, you know, they're, maybe they're talking to one of their athletes and they're slow to respond and they are they're, They look out of it. And so that may be an indication that in fact, they've had a concussion and, you know, if they don't know this information, they are not going to be picking up these injuries, but it's also really important that the athletes themselves understand what a concussion is. When we look at the data about why athletes don't report concussions, one of them is that they honestly just didn't know the symptoms they were experiencing were a possible concussion. So it's very important that they understand so they can raise their hand and say something's not right. So this, the most common symptom is a headache, um, but we also want to be careful that many of these symptoms are not specific to concussion. So we don't want you know, kids to be overly anxious and every time they have a concussion, every time they have a headache, it's a concussion. But if there's any significant contact to the head or contact to the body that moves the head forcefully and any of these symptoms, headache, nausea, dizziness, impaired balance, changes in vision, sensitivity to light and sound, ringing in the ears, and mental status changes, meaning confusion, disorientation, if any of these symptoms are experienced or any of those signs are observed, we really want someone to be pulled out from play to be evaluated. Next slide, please. And I can't say this enough. I really strongly recommend that, rec um, recommend that you all go to the Recognize and Recover. Um, U.S. Soccer has done a phenomenal job of putting together really updated information about not only concussions, but emergency action plans, cardiac health, and many of the things you're going to hear tonight. So big kudos to Dr. Champas and all the, those involved. But one of the things that I really like about the Recognize and Recover from a concussion standpoint is they have this video, and it, for time purposes, I'm not going to show it, but I really do encourage you to look at it. It's very well done in that it's from the vantage point of the athlete and what he or she may experience. And I think that's a really powerful message and something that we should be sharing with the athletes. Next slide, please. And then one of the things I recommend when I talk to coaches and teammates is to have someone that you designate to report injuries. Because I can't stress this enough, for teams, we really want to, create what we call an environment of safety. And what that means is we want athletes to feel comfortable coming forward and saying something's not right, right? Or saying something's not right with the teammate. You know, unfortunately, I've been doing this for a long time and I, I hear too many stories about players saying, I didn't want to tell anybody about my injury because I was afraid I'd get pulled or worse, I was afraid I'd be made fun of, you know, they would mock me and these things do happen. So you know, it should be a coach or a captain or a responsible adult that, that athletes feel comfortable coming for us saying, you know, I, I, I'm, I have these symptoms. I think I should be checked out. Next slide, please. And, you know, you probably have all heard this phrase, when in doubt, sit them out. And, you know, it's a really important thing to keep in mind because we don't ask that coaches and parents and players become many mental health you know, uh, medical professionals. But we ask if there's any significant contact to the head or, again, blow to the body that moves the head with significant force and any of these signs or symptoms are experienced so that they be removed from play because it, symptoms can develop and we can see medical emergencies. We'll talk about it in a second. But 
We want them to move to a place that they can be evaluated by a healthcare professional that's been appropriately trained in concussion assessment. Next slide, please. So another question I get all the time is, you know, when is it an emergency? And one of the things that you, as a parent, you really should be asking your, your clubs are, do they have an emergency action plan? And again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Recognize and Recover has done a great job establishing those for you. But, you know, not every uh, blow to the head is a concussion, and certainly not every blow to the head is also means a medical emergency. But these things do happen. Um, so, you know, the CDC lists a number of things. And, and really, the sort of the main issue is, are the symptoms getting worse? Typically, when you remove an athlete from play, their symptoms diminish or they stabilize. And so if you're seeing an athlete who is reporting that their symptoms are getting worse, the headache is increasing, they're looking more confused, they're looking more fatigued, harder to arouse, they're looking, they're suddenly having trouble speaking. This is an indication that they really should be taken emergently to a local emergency room. We also worry about repetitive vomiting. Um, not so much one, one time they throw up, athletes vomit for a lot of reasons, but when we get, uh, you know, we see repetitive vomiting, that can be an, an also an indication of medical emergency. Any loss of consciousness is of concern. Uh, any possible seizure activity, fortunately, that is rare, but we can see that uh, contact seizures. And any loss of sensation in extremities, that may be indication of a, a spinal cord injury. And so any of these danger signs indicate that someone should be taken emergently to the ER. Next slide, please. So another question I frequently get is, how do we know when somebody is recovered? And, you know, the truth is, I tell people all the time, just like we don't have a perfect way to know when someone is recovered, we also don't, I mean, when someone has a concussion, we also don't have a perfect way to know that someone's recovered. So there's sort of three prongs that we look for. And this is the same, I will tell you, from the kids all the way up to professional athletes. But we want to see, one, are they without symptoms at rest? and with exertion. And we'll talk about exertion more in a minute. But also, is their neurologic exam normal? And so we're looking for, is their balance intact? And is their ocular exam normal? Um, over the last couple of years, there's been a real explosion in the research telling us how much the eyes um, are impaired after a concussion. And secondly, is there any, any evidence of persistent cognitive deficits? Is there changes in their thinking? And there's a number of ways we're looking at this. But keep in mind that people can have persistent deficits in any of these three areas. So somebody may legitimately feel okay, but when we test their balance, it's still impaired. Or when we test their cognition, they're still impaired. And unfortunately, we still have problems with athletes not always being completely forthright. So we never want to go solely on an athlete's reporting. We want to make sure that we do have objective evidence of recovery. And I will also say too, you know, we don't, as I mentioned, we don't have a way of knowing for sure. So I will often say to athletes to, and their parents, these are the three things we look for. If, an, if a parent says, I would like to wait a little bit longer, have her continue some exertion until he or she returns to play, I think that's perfectly reasonable. We always want to make sure that everybody is comfortable, including the athlete, um, before they're returning to play. Because just like a lot of other injuries, the athletes can have a lot of fear about returning and they have to feel comfortable. And in fact, you know, uh, it's safe to return to play. Next slide, please. So the other question is, you know, what are the steps to return to play? So there's five steps, six here is actually just return to play. But the first yeah, uh, recommendation after a concussion has been diagnosed is what we call relative rest. And I, I cannot stress this enough. You know, I know that if you talk about concussions, everyone will say, you know, you need to lay in a dark room and not think and not use a phone. That's actually not true. That's not what the evidence tells us. What the data tells us really clearly is the first one to two days after concussion, we want people to take it easy. I tell people all the time, give me a day or two off of school or work, take it easy, listen to your body. Um, teenagers love it when I get in their phones back after they've been uh, restricted, but you do not have to be overly restricted. In fact, the data tells us that when people are, are overly restricted, meaning they are not allowed to do any activity, they take longer to recover. And when we start uh, activity earlier on, we see quicker recovery rates and a rather significant decrease in symptomatology. So if I'm seeing somebody and by day three, they're starting to feel better, we're starting to move them. And this is particularly true with athletes who are used to moving. You know, if you are somebody who is always exercising and moving and you suddenly stop, 
you're going to have some symptoms. So we really want to start early, low level exertion. So that may be 10, 15 minute walk, a stationary bike, just getting them moving. If they can tolerate that, then we start to increase the exertion. So we're getting the heart rate up. And that may be running, elliptical, stationary bike. Although I will tell you, I try to avoid the running. Running can be jarring to the neck and that can cause some headaches and other symptoms. So I really love a good stationary bike. Nobody gets dizzy and falls off a stationary bike. Um, and then as, we, as they can handle that higher level exertion, we start to increase what we call agility. That means increase in exertion with turning of a head because soccer and other sports are not involved just looking straight forward, right? There's lots of stopping, starting, moving the head. So we want to get them out there, get them in practice. I will oftentimes get someone back to practice sooner when we start this, not meaning that they're going back to play, but we, are, we can get them out there. We want them out in the sun, out hearing the whistles, doing those you know, sports-specific movement without contact. So in soccer, that means obviously no heading and nothing where the ball's in the air. I tell people, as soon as you start to do any scrimmaging or anything, the ball's in the air, you're out. But drills and other things where you're moving and running, we, we want to see and make sure that you remain symptom-free. And then, obviously, depending on the age, if it's age-appropriate, we do allow kids to go back to heading practice and just scrimmaging to see if any contact will cause any return of symptoms. And if they can handle non-contact practice, and along with their uh, balance and ocular testing being normal and the cognitive testing being normal, that's when we return them to play. So next slide, please. So this is a brief you know, talk. I know there's concussion is a very complex issue. Um, so I do have here my phone number and my Twitter handle. I guess we're a big Twitter group here at US Soccer. Um, but feel free, free to reach out to me and I look forward to any other questions. Thanks, George. And I'm sorry, I missed the opportunity to have any good pictures of George up here. Uh, yeah, it <laughs> seems to be a roast George night, but thank you for that. But Dr. Pirath, I do have one question. Yeah. Um, our, our club coaches are, are obviously listening in. We see a lot of you know pro athletes and, and obviously each return is individualized based on the individual, based on the mechanism, their symptoms. So we can never really say, oh, it takes five days or seven days. But in general, research with regards to return to play in the youth population, what is the average amount of time in youth players in regards to a return to play? It's a great question, George. Thank you. And I should have addressed it. So, you know, I tell people all the time, the data is very clear that generally most people recover somewhere between one to three weeks. It is not at all atypical to have symptoms for kids that last three to four weeks. Three to four weeks is still considered a very, very normal recovery. In fact, at the end of last year, the CARE Consortium is following you know, 40,000 NCAA athletes. And it was very common, a high percentage of athletes took up to four weeks to recover. So it's really, really important that people have ex normal, you know, uh, correct expectations. That you know, I tell even my pro athletes, it, listen, if you have a concussion, you're not going to be playing next weekend, right? We're going to we're going to um, monitor this. We're going to keep you out until we think that you're recovered. But we want people to have realist expectations on both ends. Because I, I will hear sometimes people say, oh, it takes six months to recover from concussion. And that's a little, you know, overwhelming and terrifying for an athlete. So we say, no, but let's follow what the data actually tells us. So generally, one to three weeks, three to four weeks. But a good percentage of kids will continue to have persistent symptoms. But the really important take home message is there are effective treatments for those persistent, persistent symptoms. So, you know, if your child is still having symptoms at three or four weeks, please, you know, reach out to, you know, a, a specialist in your area to get those symptoms addressed because we don't want kids lingering for weeks and months when we know that there's effective treatments. Thank, thanks so much, Dr. Pirath. Great information. I think everyone needs to have an emergency action plan for head injuries and concussions. Uh, make sure they go through that process and that return to play process is one that is overseen by experts in that in that field. So without question, thank you. 